My name is Panela Glaser. I work with stories, I work with play, and I work with change. And some people might say that those are just three words for learning. I have the honor of guiding you through this day of reflections. The title of this seminar is Learning Lies at the Heart of the Museum. It is borrowed from Nicola Serota, who is the director of Tate Museum. I asked my uh, three youngest sons the other day when and how they like to learn things. The six-year-old piped up immediately. I like to listen hard and think about it. And then the eight-year-old added, I like it when my teacher show us a butterfly and tell us about it and show us a real cocoon that she has found in the forest. And then the 10-year-old said, I like it when it's like a story with theater and dance and music. We are different. We like to learn things differently. And how our institutions can reflect and nurture and encourage that is one of the aspects that we will be talking about today. This day is initiated and curated by Joran Björnberg of the Swedish Exhibition Agency. He is the one who is responsible for the assignment that resides within the Swedish Exhibition Agency to explore, investigate and analyze how the museum sector and the education sector better and further can collaborate and how that could look. This seminar wishes to address how museums in the whole of Sweden can evolve into platforms for learning, or rather further evolve and develop into platforms for learning, because as you yourself are representatives of, they already are. What role can a museum play in a more digitalized and globalized world? How can Swedish museums use its professional competences, its history, in order to aid and assist and nurture a sustainable society? How can we find new ways of collaborating? We have the great pleasure and honor of having with us today four international authorities with different experiences and ideas around learning that they will share with us. John Falk, David Anderson, Margarita Sani and Anne Bamford. They will give us some ideas from their own practice before lunch. And then we will have a discussion together after lunch and we will end this day at three o'clock. When we stop this seminar, the best thing you can do is to go out, but not go so far away. Go in again and look at this museum where we are. And I would like to welcome one of its founders, Jan Broman, to tell us a little bit more about the Museum of Photography. Welcome, Jan. Hey. Jag är Roman heter jag då. Och eh, ni är i en bransch som jag känner skulle behöva lite könskvotering. Jösses vad kvinnligt det var. Eh, och vår arbetsplats är också kvinnlig i och för sig. Eh, vi är väl ungefär 60 procent kvinnor i, den, i det här företaget också. Men eh, här var det mer än 60 procent. Här är vi nog uppe mot 95. Och det, det vi skapar i sina förutsättningar. Fotografiska har snart funnits i fem år. Vi startade 2010. Och... Eh, vi är precis som ni, en, en lärande arbetsplats. Alla arbetsplatser är ju lärande förvisso. Men vi har ju då förmånen av att dessutom kunna få dela med oss av vårt lärande på ett helt annat sätt än de andra flesta människor får göra i sin, i sin vardag. Och eh, vår utmaning ligger ju hela tiden att hitta nya sätt att lära ut det vi kan. Jag tror att det som eh, lärandets största problem är att, att hitta vägar att komma utanför boxen för det måste man ju försöka göra i alla sammanhang. Men lärandet kanske är den svåraste boxen att försöka hitta utanför. För att det, 
det, det är ändå, man, ska, man, ska, man ska förmedla något ganska konkret och det finns ett antal sätt att göra det på. Men att försöka hitta nya sätt att förmedla kunskap. Det är väl det vi brottas med varje dag. Och vi testade faktiskt här för några veckor sedan eh, där vi hade barn guidar barn. Jag vet inte om någon annan har gjort det eller om, eller om det var första gången det gjordes här. Där vi lärde upp ett antal 10-11-åringar på vår utställning så fick de berätta för barn i samma ålder ute i utställningarna vad det handlade om. Och det var ju såklart något helt annat än det våra guider normalt berättar för våra besökare som har guidat i turen. Men att försöka hitta hela tiden nya sätt att, att eh, distribuera den kunskap som vi besitter. Och det är väl det ni ska försöka göra idag. Att hitta nya sätt, eller kanske framförallt med de prominenta gäster ni har, att hitta gamla sätt och kanske göra om dem till nya sätt här i Sverige. Jag antar att de har ganska rik erfarenhet i hur man gör det på vissa ställen och kan dela med sig av den. Men sen att framförallt att försöka titta på hur kan man paketera om det här och hur kan vi göra någonting som blir unikt och som blir speciellt för det vi håller på med. Det är väl det som är vår största uppgift inom den här sektorn. För kunskap är ju verkligen det vi lever på. Och den kunskapen måste vi vara generösare med, tror jag, allihopa, mot våra gäster. Att se till att de verkligen får ta del av den fantastiska rikedom som finns. Jag hoppas att ni får en fantastisk dag. Och att ni har en härlig tur i utställningen så småningom. Och att ni lär er massor och att vi får lära er massor på era arbetsplatser sen. Utifrån den här dagen. Ha en bra dag. Our first speaker today is internationally known and renewed for his uh, research on free choice learning. Free choice learning is the learning that takes place when a person has significant control over his or her own learning. With whom he or she is learning, where and how. He is the founding director of the Center of Research on Lifelong Learning. And he is now the co-director of the Institute for Learning Innovation, a non-profit organization that works with learning innovation. He has focused a lot of research on free choice learning, both on an individual and an institutional level and looked particularly on museums and eco-tourism venues. I welcome John Faulk. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. I'll see how easy it is to stay on time. Um, Well, it's probably a truism uh, to suggest that we are in the midst of rapid change here in the 21st century. Uh, change certainly in the nature of commerce, change in the nature of how people spend their leisure time and their relationship between leisure and work, and certainly change in when and where and why people learn. In fact, uh, it's been argued that, you know, there's you know, there been many names given to this new age in terms of the knowledge society and various things, but um, I prefer the word learning society because in many ways, um, in many ways, uh, learning, learning is uh, the coin of the realm, um, and it's the coin of the realm in commerce and leisure and increasingly in terms of how people find self-satisfaction. So that's all good, but what hasn't changed fundamentally is why people learn. Um, since the beginning of, in fact, I would argue since the beginning of life on Earth, um, the reason that organisms learn, but certainly why humans learn, is to um, satisfy the needs of self. Um, in today's world, we learn in order to develop our own personal growth and development. We learn in order to support the needs of ourselves and our significant others. And we learn in order to support our welfare, economic, social, and otherwise. But uh, at fundamentally, 
at the core, all of us learn in order to satisfy our own personal identity-related needs. Um, where we learn, though, as I alluded, has changed. You know, once upon a time, um, in the not too distant past, um, the words learning, education, and school were dealt with as synonyms. I, I dare say, unfortunately, many in society, particularly politicians, still deal with the words learning, education, and school as if they're synonyms. Um, uh, uh, you know, including some of our citizens. So, uh, Pernilla's uh, six-year-old daughter, I guess it was, who's, when asked where do you learn, immediately assumed that um, she was talking about school. Um, if you ask most citizens about learning, they'll immediately assume you're talking about schooling. But learning is much deeper, and obviously, for those of us in this room, we all understand that the people who visit our institutions um, don't believe they're going to school, but yet they um, are participating in learning experiences. But we learn across our lifespan and across our day. All the time we're learning. But um, in today's world, people are learning in um, schools, but they're learning in the workplace, they're learning at home, they're learning on the internet increasingly. And as I alluded, they are increasingly using their leisure time to learn as well. And that's where museums come in. And although many museums um, who have education departments, which again, historically, have been um, defined as the education department is the, the group that deals with schools, um, but museums are educational institutions, and the vast majority of visitors to museums worldwide and as I understand it, I'm not an expert on what goes on in Sweden, but as I ask my colleagues, um, the majority of visitors to museums here are not school children. They're the general public. And um, as I like to say, uh, if you ask people, did you come here to learn, that might make them nervous because, again, they associate the words with learning uh, with schooling. But there's no mistake that they think of these places, museums, as educational institutions. They're under no illusion that they've come to an amusement park. They're under no illusion they've gone to a shopping mall. They understand that there is educational value in these settings. And, um, and learn indeed, they do. In fact, let me have um, the, my first slide. Um, I just couldn't resist because I am a research wonk that I was going to show you some data. So I, I recently had the pleasure of um, doing an international study um, called the International Science Center Impact Study. And uh, two of the institutions that were involved were Swedish. I should say it's an unusual study, too, because it was self-funded. Every one of the 17 institutions indicated here um, paid their own money to participate and actually paid to hire me and my team to conduct the research, but they also helped to collect the data as well. Um, 17 institutions from 13 different countries, and as you might see, um, we had two, two populations we were sampling. These are random samples of the general public, um, either adults, 18 and older, or youth, 14 and 15 year old youth, large sample, um, 11,000 individuals um, collectively. And I'm not gonna go into great detail, but suffice to say that what we were trying to understand is what was the relative consequence of going to a science center on a whole range of learning outcomes. And if I could have the next slide. Um, this is just for the youth data. Um, and what you can see is that uh, as a function of changes in knowledge and understanding, interest and curiosity, um, out of school engagement in other kinds of learning experiences, science and technology related, um, vocations um, in terms of, uh, in this case, aspirations to be um, in a career in science and technology, avocations, which turns out to be a word that 
a lot of folks don't know, but that's hobbies. Um, so science and technology related hobbies. And then finally, um, confidence in themselves as a science or technology learner. And what the data basically shows is that um, uh, the more recent, that if you visited the Science Center more recently, i.e. within the last year, and the more frequently you visited, the more significant the impact was. And if you visited at least two times over the previous year, um, your um, learning across all these dimensions was significantly greater than people who hadn't visited, youth who hadn't visited. Now, and actually the results for adults, believe it or not, were even stronger. Um, overall, uh, in all of these communities across the world, um, something on average of 55% to 60% of all the citizens had not visited a science center, but about 45% had visited a science center at least once in their life. Um, now, this is a large data set. It's not a randomized controlled study. It was just, um, it's using what's called correlational data. And so some people have said, well, obviously the people who visit science centers are better educated, they're more affluent, and obviously they're self-interested. And so what you're seeing in terms of the results are just that the people who are most interested or most educated or most affluent are the people who are benefiting and everybody else isn't. Um, but fortunately, it's a large data set and we had a lot of questions. And so if we can show the next slide. What I was able to do was um, look at a whole range. This just relates to interest and engagement. So this is with the adult data. So if you think about, okay, uh, if I ask adults, um, what do you do in your spare time? Do you do anything science and technology related? What was your favorite subject in school? Um, questions like that. It turns out we could divide the public into three populations. There were those who really liked science and technology. There were those who actually sort of liked science and technology. And then there was a group that disliked science and technology. Um, and not surprisingly, um, there was a difference in terms of how many of them visited a science center. Um, interestingly enough, that even the group that really liked science, only half of them visited the science center. The population that sort of liked it, 40%. And even, interestingly, the population that claimed to dislike science and technology, 30% visited the science center. And then, but the kicker is this next slide, which, if you can decipher that, basically, Let's look at each of those three populations as a function of whether they visited the Science Center or not. And if you just pay attention to the first line, and I won't go into the next two lines, but the first line is knowledge. And what you find is that regardless of what your entering interest was or engagement, if you visited the Science Center, you were significantly more likely to be knowledgeable in science and technology than if you didn't visit. And that was true if you were really like science, it was true if you sort of like science, it was true even if you didn't like science, going to one of these centers increased your knowledge. So, um, we can get rid of those slides. The bottom line is that whether we think of our institutions as learning institutions, whether the public thinks of them as learning institutions or not, they are learning institutions because the people who go to them learn. <laughs> So, why do people ultimately go to science centers or museums of any kind? And I've done a bunch of research about this, and perhaps given my opening comments, it's no surprise that my conclusion is the reason people go to places like museums is to satisfy their own identity-related needs. Now, people have many identity-related needs. They don't just go to science centers um, because they need to learn something. In fact, very few people wake up on a Saturday morning and say, gee, I wonder what a sunken Swedish vessel really looks like. <laughs> I know, I'll go to the Vasa Museum and find out. Um, no, that's not why people go. So they, you know, they, learning happens, but that is by and large not their explicit motivation. Their motivations are they wake up on a Saturday morning 
and they think about what their needs are. Um, they're thinking about, well, I'd like to do something that um, might be satisfying for me personally. I'm a curious person, and I like to do things that satisfy my curiosity. Um, I happen to like, um, uh, you know, Swedish history. Oh, you know, maybe maybe I'll go to Skansen. Or more likely, um, I've you know I've, I've been working so hard that I've been neglecting my children. I should do something good for my children. I'll take them to Skansen. Um, there's um, so people have needs, and they're trying to think about what those needs are. I should do something with my children. I should do something with my significant other. I should satisfy my curiosity. Um, perhaps I should. Um, I've just been so stressed out at work. I just need to go someplace quiet, that's away from all the traffic that I can just relax. Um, or someone like me says, okay, I'm here in Stockholm. What do you do when you're in Stockholm? I don't know. Um, people say, well, you should go to the, you know, uh, the Vasa Museum, or you should go to Skansen, or you should go, uh, as I did yesterday, I went to the Spirit Museum. Um, so um, uh, I go to satisfy certain kinds of those needs. Um, Sometimes people have needs that relate to, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I feeling like I, um, not only should I do something good with my children, but I want them to have an educational experience. So I want to find a place to take them that will be satisfying in terms of their educational experience. And so maybe I will take them to a history museum or um, perhaps an art museum or, or even a science museum. But the trick is, um, I usually, when I have this, I don't begin by thinking what I want to do is go to a museum. I think that I have these needs. And then I try and think through my repertoire of what are the places that can satisfy those needs. And for a certain percentage of the public, and if you use that data from science centers as an example, um, something on the order of half the public, thinks that at some point over the course of the year, those needs can be met by going to a place like a science center or a history museum or an art museum. And about half the public doesn't think that because in their mind, they have the same needs, but they don't see museums as places that would satisfy those needs. And so they go to other places and do other things in order to satisfy those needs. So I still want to do something great with my child, so maybe I'll take them skating. Or I want to do something great with my child, um, maybe we should go to the shopping mall. Um, and actually, these are not mutually exclusive, because we sometimes in our community fall into the trap of thinking it's either or. You either go shopping or you go to the museum, but most people do both. Um, we can also go shopping and we can go to the, the museum, but probably not on the same day. Um, at any rate, not surprisingly then, when you try and figure out what it is that museums do best, museums do best when they are satisfying those public's identity-related needs. So they are at their best when they create environments that allow people to satisfy their curiosity and interest. They're at their best when they allow parents or other people to have a social environment that supports their needs in terms of being a good parent or a good significant other. Um, or you have a, a relative or a friend visiting from out of town. You're supporting their need to do something to find out more about the local community by escorting them or taking them or encouraging them to go to a museum. Um, and so we as institutions, as learning institutions, are best when we basically support the free choice needs of our publics. Now, if that doesn't sound like school, there's a good reason for that. It isn't school. Um, had an interesting discussion at dinner last night. You know, I, I made the bold, you know, the concern came up about um, often the content of museums. Um, actually, it was specifically someone who was talking about going to a museum in the US and being concerned about what was not contained within the exhibition, that they felt that it was 
sort of a slanted exhibition that it only contained a part of the story that should have been told. My feeling is that's probably true, but so what? Most people don't go to museums as a free choice learning experience in order to have the whole story. They go to satisfy their own needs, which only rarely is to learn the whole story. Typically, their needs are, I'm trying to find something cool that I've never seen before. I'm trying to help my kid um, get excited about learning. I'm trying to amuse myself um, on a day in Stockholm. I'm trying to um, go to a place where I can decompress and relax. None of those are motivations that say what you're trying to do is learn the whole story. And the other thing is, as I alluded to earlier, all of our institutions are part of this very large ecosystem of learning that exists in our culture. And so there are not, you, you are not the final bastion of all knowledge. You are not, you know, my ability to learn is not dependent on my going to your institution. I don't feel obliged, I don't feel like you're obliged to give me the whole story as a visitor. Now you may, as a museum, be obliged to tell the whole story, but as a visitor, I'm not obliged to hear the whole story, and I don't ever assume that I'm gonna get the whole story. Why would I? If I'm visiting your museum, and now I'm talking about you know, the 70, 80% of visitors who come in their free time, I'm not coming to get the complete story. I'm getting, coming to get a story. I wanna hear a story. I want to find out stuff that's new and exciting. But if I wanted to get the whole complete story, I'd check a book out of the library and read the whole story. And it would probably take me more than an hour um, that I'm going to invest in your institution in that one exhibit. Um, I don't expect in an hour to get the whole story on anything. Why would I? That's an unreasonable expectation. And so it's not, and so in fact, what I often ask museum people, Okay, you know, you have these high learning goals, but let's get real. The average visitor is going to spend at most two to three hours in your institution, and, but that's in your entire institution. So in any particular exhibition, you know, they may spend 15, 20 minutes. And so the question is, what would you expect someone to learn in 15 to 20 minutes in a day, 15 to 20 minutes in a year, 15 to 20 minutes in a lifetime. Well, not much. The amazing thing is that 10 years later, most people can tell you at least something about what they did in that museum, even though they only spent a couple hours there 10 years ago. And I would challenge most educational institutions to do as well, <laughs> um, to tell you, okay, so you spent a day in a classroom. Tell me 10 years ago, what did you learn in the classroom 10 years earlier? Um, take that challenge. But that's not this, and, but I'm not trying to set this up as a competition between museums and schools. I'm merely trying to suggest that museums should not think of themselves as schools and should not fall into the trap of thinking that when we say we want to be learning institutions, that the model of learning is a school model. Schools are great, so are museums. And actually, what we need to do are create partnerships and collaborations where institutions can do the things together that they do best. Schools should do the things that they do best. And they can use museums to support that. Museums should do what they do best, and where appropriate, they should collaborate with schools to help them accomplish that. But historically, most museums, although they have partnerships with lots of organizations, have defined their goals as what happens in the box. My responsibility is from the moment somebody walks in the front door to the time they walk out the front door. That's my responsibility. That's what I have some control over. But that is actually not 
what you should be perceiving because learning doesn't just happen in the box. In fact, the biggest predictor of what someone will learn in the box, in your museum, is what they already know, already are interested in, and come to do. And actually, um, right up there with inf influences in terms of what people will ultimately remember about your institution is what happens in the hours and days and weeks after they visit your museum. Because in the absence of reinforcing experiences, what happened inside the box of your institution will disappear. So you have to see your museum as part of this whole. You are part of a larger ecosystem. And you know, if I can make a recommendation for how museums should behave in the 21st century, it is about how do we um, not see ourselves as destinations, but see ourselves as contributing to journeys that people are passing through us, how can we make that journey a successful journey for our visitors and make it such that whatever we do supports their needs and their interests, not only while they're in our institutions, but after they leave our institutions as well. Um, and so I think that's where I'll stop for the moment and I'll have the opportunity to come back and talk again. <laughs> I just want to ask you uh, uh, one question now. There are zillions in the audience that will come after lunch <laughs> and some more from me. Uh, but uh, when you speak about uh, being in dialogue with these identity needs uh, from the visitor, uh, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on how that can... Be? You, you mentioned a couple of examples like, okay, we can you can facilitate uh, a social arena, or you can, you can incorporate these things within, your, within the box. And you also talked about the perspective of being more of a journey rather than destination. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on how, how that can look like in your, your experience to that dialogue? Well, uh, I'll give a couple examples. Um, just sort of reinforcing the fact that um, if half the public never visits your institution. Um, in large part, it is because they don't perceive your institution as supporting their needs. So the first thing, most institutions are eager to try and broaden their audience. Um, the first challenge is to help the public think about your institution as a place that could satisfy those basic human needs. So, Everybody has social needs. Everybody is curious. Um, everybody um, who is above a certain minimum economic standard, who isn't worried about a roof over their head or the next meal, um, has, has leisure time and is looking for ways to, to do that in a meaningful way. And so it is about thinking about, um, and I'll use the ugly word marketing, but it is about promoting and um, uh, presenting your institution as um, places that can satisfy those needs. And very concretely, um, I would challenge all of you to look at the website of your museum and ask yourself, is this a website that communicates this is a great place to be social? How many people are on your website as opposed to just objects or pictures of your institution? Um, how many of you project that this would be actually a very lovely place to just sit down and relax? How many of you project on your website that this is um, a place that could uh, um, satisfy an individual curiosity as opposed to a content-oriented you know, story? Mm. Um, and so, yeah. good exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, no. I, 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 I just go, have I to. Go on, yeah, yeah. But you <laughs> will go on in a while. But I just have one one more question that I also want to come back to in our yeah. discussion in the afternoon. Uh, do you have an example of a, an environment, a free choice learning environment, where you, that you think is 
Wow, this is interesting, and uh, not necessarily incorporated in the museum, but uh, where you where you feel that this is a place where where things are happening in another way. It's not school, not necessarily a museum, but something else. Sure. Um, well, certainly in North America, um, the, there's a lot of buzz and excitement, probably overrated in some cases, but um, around the whole do-it-yourself maker movement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, part of my concern is that people are so eager to get on that bandwagon that they are probably going to ruin that experience. But mm -hmm. at the moment, um, it is very much a grassroots generated movement where individuals um, find ways to come together um, to support their own interests mm. and to create the things that they are interested in. Mm. And there are, um, to the extent that they mostly can find human resources that can help them support yeah. that need, um, that is probably indicative of where things are going in the future, mm. where it is a future increasingly driven by personal and individual needs and interests rather than institutional um, top-down notions of this is what you should know and this is what you should Great. learn. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, John. Sure. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you.